G'day guys, my name's Chris. Hi. I'm here from Moreland City Council just to show you a bit about this tractor and how it works and what we do and how we uh, get around and cut all the grass on the ovals. How's that? Is that better? <laughs> so you want to play tag with the tractor? Your teachers would like that. Thank you very much. Bye, goodbye. Bye. In 2009, Council began research and consultation to identify the key challenges in sport for women and girls within Moreland. The review identified several issues. There was a serious lack of female competition and teams. Only 8% of participants using Council sports grounds were female. To address this inequality, Council introduced a policy to encourage clubs to be more inclusive of women, juniors, people with a disability and people from culturally diverse communities or risk losing an allocation of a ground to a club that is being inclusive. Female participation has now increased by 161% in Moreland. West Coburg Football Club is proud to align with Moreland's policy. This year we successfully launched the club's first ever under 12 girls footy team. We're changing our club. We're changing our culture. I'm changing the game. So I'm Claire Johnston and I'm an accredited cricket bat maker and the first female in the world. I um, learnt how to make cricket bats from Ian Callan. There's a lot of bats out there for men and I felt that there was an opportunity there to actually work with women to make better bats and to actually make them for their style. So recently I was commissioned to make five cricket bats for the Pasco Vale Headfield uh, Cricket Club for their under-13s girls cricket team and uh, yeah, to see their faces when they were given the cricket bats was just brilliant. So what I'd really love to be able to do is to keep working with my local community, the local cricket clubs, um, particularly the women, and uh, yeah, work to make great cricket bats. My name's Leslie. I have been with Moreland Family Day Care as an educator for over 36 years, I think. Family Day Care is a wonderful organisation. We look after children in our own home, they blend in with the family and it's fantastic. I love Family Day Care. I can choose my own hours, very flexible. I've made wonderful friendships with lots of the families. I'm now looking after children of the children I used to care for. The children just growing and developing is a wonderful, wonderful experience for me every day. I'd recommend family daycare to anybody and everybody. Me. Oh, oh. oh, where's my scouty snuggle? Where's my scouty snuggle? Can I have a scouty snuggle? Mm. How's your tea party going? My name's Hilary, I've been with Moreland Family Daycare for eight months now and I absolutely love it. The main reason I started with Family Daycare was to be with my little one. Family Daycare is a small environment so mostly I only have four children and it's in a home. Moreland have been really supportive with the whole thing and they helped me find children when I first started. There's so many benefits of working family day care and becoming an educator. Working in your own home, flexible hours, also just watching the other children grow and being such a part of their life. I recommend to educators that want a good life balance if they have their own child. Family day care is a great avenue to go down. Hey Moreland, today I'm down in St Kilda for the Midsummer Pride March supporting the LGBTQ community. It's a beautiful day, I'm proud to be here representing Moreland, walking behind so many wonderful dedicated people. This march goes towards exactly what our values are.
Well, good evening, councillors, members of the gallery, and to our viewers live streaming tonight's meeting. My name is John Kavanagh, and I'm the Mayor of the City of Moreland. It's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's meeting, which is for Council to consider planning and related matters. In the past, this meeting used to be called the Urban Planning Committee. For, for members of the gallery, that doesn't mean many differences to you, but for councillors, it means that we consider this to be an official council meeting, and it means that, as such, the mayor is the chair of that meeting, and any councillor who is absent is recorded in the annual report as being absent. So, our meeting is being held on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people, and I wish to acknowledge them as the traditional owners of the land. I'd also like to pay my respects to their elders, past and present, and elders of other communities that might be with us this evening. I acknowledge that currently many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have made Moreland home, and in doing so, they have contributed to the rich diversity of this municipality. Members of the gallery, please note that this meeting is being recorded and web streamed live to Council's website and Facebook. This meeting will be available as video on demand. Gallery attendees are advised that you will be recorded during the meeting. Councillors, just as a reminder, in line of the adopted councillor conduct principles, as outlined in the councillor uh, code of conduct, councillors should ensure that they conduct themselves at this meeting with integrity, impartially exercising their responsibility in the interest of the local community, and not properly, improperly seek to confer or advantage any person. This behaviour will support principles of leadership and good governance that secures public confidence in the office of councillor. <laughs> Members of the gallery, in the event of an emergency or disruption, you may be required to take uh, you may be required to take action to ensure the safety of attendees. Please follow the direction of council staff and security officers, and I thank you for your understanding in that. Councillors in attendance tonight, starting from my right, is Councillor Sue Bolton. Councillor Anna Olivia Carly Hannon, Councillor Helen Davidson, Councillor Jess Dorney, the Deputy Mayor, Councillor Natalie Abood, and then we have Councillor Ali Farnley, Councillor Dale Martin, Councillor Mark Riley, Councillor Lambros Tapnos, and we have Councillor Oscar Yildiz JP. For your information uh, uh, to the public, uh, Councillor Yildiz has to fly out to uh, Perth tonight, and so he'll be leaving the meeting early and uh, wish you a safe flight, Councillor. All right. Uh, the officers in attendance tonight, to my to my left, we have the acting group manager of city De development, Nail, uh, Narelle Jennings. We have the acting <coughs> unit manager of urban planning, Robert Stafford. We have the acting planning coordinator, Andy Wilson. Acting planning coordinator, Lachlan McGowan. Unit manager of governance, Sally Curran, and governance officer, Saskia Hunter. Apologies. I don't think we have any apologies tonight, councillors. So we'll go to the adoption of the minutes. Could I have a motion for the adoption of the minutes of what was then the Urban Planning Committee meeting that was held on the 23rd of May, 2018? Moved by Councillor Yildiz, seconded by Councillor O'Farnley. Any discussion? Being no discussion, I'll put that to the vote. All those in favour, against, declare that carried. Councillors, are there any interests or conflicts of interest to declare? There being none, we'll move on to the next part of the meeting. For those of you attending or tuning in on live streaming for the first time, I'll give you an outline of how the meeting will run this evening. Uh, the, first, the relevant planner will introduce the report and the officer recommendation. Then I'll give objectors the opportunity to move to the lectern and to uh, make a submission. And thirdly, at this time, after that's complete, I'll ask the applicant to, uh, an opportunity to speak for a period of time as well. If you are making a submission, and obviously we've got many people in the gallery tonight, I ask you to state your name. It says address here, but street will be fine. You don't have to give a number for the record. Please try to present your viewpoints on why you support or oppose the application. Please try not to, complete, uh, to uh, repeat what earlier speakers have said and keep the discussion focused on relevant issues and points not previously raised. If you are opposed to a planning application, please inform the meeting why you are opposed and, if possible, suggest an alternative approach that would satisfy your concerns. Please use the opportunity to focus on your concerns rather than raise matters of detail that are in the officer report. Now, I'll talk about the limit of time uh, after we have the officer, recommend, uh, the officer report for the first point. So the first report, which I think many people are here tonight, is for DED 40 
18, which is 699 and 701 Park Street, 182, and then 184 to 186, 188, and 190 to 192 Brunswick Road, 2 and 4 Sydney Road, Brunswick, a mixed use development. All right, so I'll ask for the officer to uh, lead us in, in leading us through this application, please. And the officer to do so is Robert, is it? Uh, Andy. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Councillor Kavanagh. Uh, so the uh, application before you at the moment is a uh, proposal for 255 dwellings. Uh, sorry, I'll go back a, a slide uh, to the subject site, which is in the intersection of Brunswick Road and Sydney Road, or just behind the intersection there. Uh, a number of lots, as Councillor Kavanagh just mentioned. Uh, the site is subject to the mixed use zone and uh, included within the design and development overlay 18, and as well as heritage overlay 279 and 149, uh, included within the parking overlay, and a portion of the site is also within the environmental audit overlay. <coughs> Proposal includes 255 dwellings, including 243 apartments and 12 townhouses, a childcare centre constructed across four levels in the northeast mm -hmm. corner of the site, food and beverage and retail space at the ground level in the intersection of Park Street and Sydney Road, a, a small uh, space defined as a community hub located on Brunswick Road uh, at ground level, um, a central communal courtyard at level one, as well as two communal rooftop terraces, and then a six metre wide pedestrian laneway between Park Street and Brunswick Road, which is located <coughs> on the eastern boundary, uh, as well as vehicle access from Park Street in the southeastern corner. Uh, a total of 401 car parking spaces and 83 bicycle parking spaces um, will be included in the proposal. Uh, the plan on the screen there just gives you an indication of the, the ground floor plan. This is the access point shown here in the southeastern corner and the laneway that runs through the site, or proposed to run through the site. The small community hub proposed here, childcare centre in this corner of, of the site and the food and drink premises uh, in this corner of the site. <coughs> this uh, 3D representation gives you an indication of the, the various buildings proposed on the site and the different heights of those buildings. It might be a little bit difficult to read, but you probably have all read that this is a 14-storey tower in the centre of the site, uh, proposed to be seven storeys in the corner of Sydney Road and Park Street. Townhouses of three-storey uh, plus rooftop terraces on Park Street. Uh, six storeys on uh, on the interface with the eastern residential land, dropping down to um, four storeys at the interface there. And then wrapping around Brunswick Road, we have a, a proposal for four storeys uh, and then up to eight storeys uh, along Brunswick Road. <coughs> Some 3D representations uh, or images that Picked how the proposal will appear from Parks, uh, sorry, from Princes Park, and then from Park Street, looking back towards Royal Parade. From Royal Parade, uh, before it turns into Sydney Road, and then from Brunswick Road, looking back towards Sydney Road. During public notice, 220 objections were received, including objections from the City of Yarra and the City of Melbourne. Uh, the main issues raised in those objections were character impacts and the height of the proposal, impacts on traffic in the locality, loss of amenity including overshadowing and overlooking, uh, including overshadowing in Princess Park, demolition of heritage buildings, or the heritage building I should say, uh, and impact on infrastructure including public transport in the area. The key considerations from a planning point of view are the height and setbacks of the buildings, internal and external amenity impacts, uh, extent of car parking that's been proposed and bicycle parking provision, and also the demolition of the heritage building. Officers are recommending that council's position at VCAT be that the application be refused. So an appeal has been lodged by the applicant prior to council making a decision. <coughs> that's uh, <coughs> described as a failure to determine, so council has not decided on the application within the prescribed time of 60 days. Uh, the height of the central tower and the street wall heights to Sydney Road and Park Street are excessive. Uh, sorry, these are the grounds of refusal that are recommended, or a summary of them. A bit, the building setbacks to the west are inadequate, that's to Sydney Road, and the extent of walls on boundaries to the west are excessive. The 
poor visual amenity with regards to the expanse of unbroken building form presented to Brunswick Road at the upper levels and the southwest corner of Sydney Road. Uh, poor activation of the ground level for sections of Brunswick Road frontage. An inadequate number of bicycle parking spaces provided to encourage the minimisation of car dependence and encourage people to cycle. And the development will result in poor energy performance, poor cross ventilation, insufficient green for site contributing to the urban heat island effect and insufficient green waste facilities to reduce waste generation. Uh, and the demolition of the electricity supply transformer station will result in removal of heritage fabric adversely affecting the heritage place. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andy, for that uh, excellent summation. Um, when I was introducing before, I did neglect to uh, thank uh, Councillor Dale Martin for his chairing of the Urban Planning Committee for the last eight months. So thank you very much, Councillor, for your work on that. Uh, now, uh, as we can see, we've got a lot of objectors here tonight, I would assume. Um, can I ask you to raise your hand if you did want to speak tonight? Okay, that seems a reasonable amount of people, so I'll take all speakers that would like to speak. Would you like to start? Would you like to start? Yes. How long do you get? So, uh, th uh, three minutes normally. If you are speaking on behalf of a range of people, I will allow you to speak a little bit longer than that. But uh, keeping in mind that we do have an officer recommendation before us that is recommending refusal at this point, that doesn't mean that that's done, but it's, it's worth keeping in mind. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mayor Good and councillors. And before I start, I too recognise the Wurundjeri people yeah. as the traditional owners mm. of the land we meet on. I pay my respects to their elders past and present. Thank you. Now, uh, my name is Adrian Clark. Uh, I'm a ratepayer from Gold Street in Brunswick, but I reside in um, Lang Street in Princes Hill. I'm speaking on behalf of Miss Christine Christian, who's currently overseas. She's the president of a residence group that we formed early last year in response to the media in which we were first informed of this proposal in its earlier uh, incarnation. <coughs> the group is an incorporated entity, Protect Park Street Precinct Proprietary Limited, and our members are from the cities of Moreland, Yarra and Melbourne. We came to, together to oppose these plans which would have serious and very detrimental effect to all our communities in Brunswick, Princes Hill and Parkville. We're also very concerned to protect Princes Park. It's managed by the City of Melbourne and enjoyed by all our communities. We currently have about 1,000 members, which is uh, listed in our email list, our Facebook page, and it includes the Parkville Association. So that's who we are. Now, to address the report, we're very pleased to see that the report recommends refusal, and we hope you as councillors <coughs> will support that refusal. We're very pleased with several aspects of the report. For example, that the council is sensitive to the heritage setting of the site and recommends against demolition of the, of the substation. However, there are several issues in the report which are of concern to us. The first is the height limit, according to DDO 18, which you showed, Map 1B, for this site <coughs> is 25 metres. In the report, the City Branch Business Unit correctly states this on page 9 that the height should be reduced to meet the preferred height of 25 metres, which equates to eight levels. However, there are several references in the body of the report that reference a tower of up to 10, 10 storeys. These statements are incompatible with the DDO 18 specification. People are asking why would the council consider a height above the DDO 18 specification, and in particular they ask who benefits clearly not the community, and so in the absence of any explanation, people will speculate. So we ask that there should be no recommendation to exceed the DDO 18 limit of 25 metres, eight levels. We will argue, actually, that it should be much lower than 25 metres, probably to the equivalent of four storeys, to prevent any overshadowing of the park and its surrounds. That brings us to the question of the overshadowing. We understand that the test that you've applied in Norland is the spring equinox. However, overshadowing by this standard will cause irreparable damage to the park. This is detailed in the objection received by Moreland on the 17th of May from the City of Melbourne. There is no reference to this objection in the report. 
The City of Melbourne objection is specifically concerned with overshadowing Prince's Park at the winter solstice. It points out that winter overshadowing will affect the health of the 120-year-old elm, elm trees, which cannot tolerate changes in light. Consequently, the bird life will also be affected. The City of Melbourne objection also states that overshadowing as a result of the proposal will have an adverse impact on the amenity of Prince's Park and is contrary to the provisions of the Melbourne Planning Scheme, including the State Planning Policy Framework. This park is not an asset of the City of Moreland, and we question whether Moreland could knowingly cause such damage to the busiest park in the City of Melbourne. Apart from the direct damage, the runners and walkers will be devastated to find themselves running in shadows during the winter. We could, as an aside, ask why has not more open space been provided in South Ward by the City of Moreland for all the new residents who've come into the area? That's, that's by the way. OK, back to the report. Another serious concern is that the objections lodged by the City of Yarra on the May the 16th and the 25th are not mentioned in the report. These objections specifically address concerns of height, parking on site, vehicle access for Park Street, and adverse impacts on the heritage streetscape. The proposal to put all the traffic generated into Park Street, a residential street, is not workable. There are many of the detail, many details of the plans we could query. However, as the decision is now up to VCAT, we'll reserve these arguments for the tribunal. We urge the council to refuse this application. We also request the council to allocate adequate budget and to engage senior counsel to represent Moreland at VCAT hearings and refuse this proposal. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Alison. <laughs> Thank you very much for that objection, and I did give you more time because you were speaking on behalf of some others. Yes, Elizabeth, uh, can I also acknowledge Elizabeth Jackson as a former mayor of Brunswick, and it's good to have you here, Elizabeth. Thank you very much, Mr Mayor. Um, my name's Elizabeth Jackson. I live in Brunswick Road. Um, I'd like to congratulate the planning department who once again produced an excellent report and recommendation. Um, they've really covered all the issues very well, I thought. Um, I just want to speak a little bit about the substation. Um, as part of my role in Brunswick Council, I was for a time the chair of the Brunswick Electricity Supply Board. Um, I think many people have forgotten that Brunswick and Coburg, together with I think about 11 other suburbs, had their own electricity Just supply in. departments yeah. from about 1912 yeah. to 1994. Um, in Brunswick's case, we were able to use it to um, implement a number of um, energy efficiency measures which were quite um, forward thinking for their time. And um, I think a lot of people remember the electricity supply very fondly. This substation, um, although it's not a very glamorous looking building, mm -hmm. is a reminder of that and I would very much like to see it retained. Uh, I believe it could be incorporated into any new development and repurposed into a cafe or the community centre, which in, in fact is part of the present proposal. So I, I just wanted to make sure that it wasn't forgotten about. And thank you. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Uh, yes, sir, if you come forward. Uh, my name's Simon Greve. I live in Lanark Street, Richmond, and I'm a town planner, assisting my friends who are objecting to this, who for the most part, for the most part live in Yarra. Can you hear me? Ben. Um, I've got three points to make, um, the first two of which come with diagrams, which I'd like to give you now. Uh, <coughs> We can pass them we'll around. Pass them around. That's right. Thank Happy you. Happy to. Yep. The first issue I think you must consider is height. Those 3D drawings that you've now got were prepared by us, and they describe the extent of building height in excess of the preferred heights, as you'll find at uh, Map 1B of DDO 18. Yep. The red bits on top are those parts of the building in excess of that preferred set of height limits. We've 
this is a reconciliation of what's being proposed against what I say is in the um, uh, DDO 18 MAP 1B um, provisions. We've prepared this because the applicant didn't. Of the 22 3D diagrams which appear in the architect's content report, this thing, which you've no doubt seen, yep. what you've got in front of you now does not appear in that. Right. Um, we're sitting here tonight only because the applicants elected to breach these preferred height limits. Had they complied with the limits, the objectors um, here tonight would have no appeal rights and we would not be sitting here tonight in front of you. In effect, JW Land has chosen at their own initiative to jettison the advantage available by complying with the height limits by asking for more. And the red portion on that diagram is what they want over and above the height limits specified at DDO 18. Second point I want to make has to do with shadows. I'll praise you this because Adrian's already referred to it. Um, we have also prepared the worst case shadow. Um, yeah, that's fine. Right. Thank you. That's, that's what the shadows would look like between 9 a.m. and 3 a few days ago on the 22nd of June. Moreland's planners have described that shadowing as minor relative to the size of Princess Park. Of course, size is irrelevant to purpose. It's precisely because the northern portion of the park is dedicated to passive use that it's of particular value even to moorland residents. The overshadowing that results is in no sense minor, but the idea that any shadows should be thrown where none now exist is offensive, not least to the city of Melbourne who owns the park, who have objected primarily for that reason. I say in any event, it's not for this body to be consenting to development that damages a Melbourne City Council asset. Finally, a word on discretion, which no doubt you hear a lot about in your planning deliberations. With respect to height and shadows, Moreland has a discretion to make a judgment as to whether what is proposed is acceptable or unacceptable. That's what discretion means. In this case, the discretion does not mean that the only option is the preferred heights or higher. It must also mean that you consider a building form lower than the preferred heights, otherwise it's not truly discretion. The, planner recomm the planner's recommendation in this case canvases a 10-storey compromise. That's unacceptable. It's unacceptable to us, indeed in truth, it's not, not what has been applied for and is a change of such magnitude that it is in effect a new proposal. Objectors have been given no idea how or why this compromise was arrived at. In fact, so far as we're, we're aware, neither is the applicant. In this case, as in most cases like this, and you'd expect me to say this, is of a very big building opposite one of Melbourne's most important parks, context is everything. And it's, in this case, it's hard to imagine a more historic, exposed, or sensitive site. These are the criteria which must be applied when you exercise your discretion here tonight. Thank you very much indeed. I've sir. reduced no. this to writing. If you want copies. No, that's fine. No, but I'm very happy with the one. Thank okay. you so much indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Graham Morris uh, from Garton Street in Princess Hill, and I'm also a member of the Protect Park Street group. So I'm speaking as one of those uh, residents. Um, I'd like to, before I start, thank uh, the council, and particularly the council officers, the planning officers, for the assistance and support that they've given us and the access that they've given us during this process. We really do appreciate that. Thank you very much. It's very kind um, of you. 
I'd like to talk about traffic, which is a matter of deep yeah. concern. And uh, I'm sorry to see that it hasn't been uh, mentioned uh, to any great extent in the, uh, in, in the report that's yeah. gone to council. Um, there is mention uh, of a comment by Vic Rhodes, which I'm sure all of us will endorse, um, to the effect that Vic Rhodes notes the high number of cyclists that use both Park Street and Royal Parade and that the proposed development needs to consider safe operation of cyclists and other road users. Um, the council officers have noted that, but don't seem to have taken into account how that might be remedied. And I would like to discuss that in some detail. Um, I don't know if we could get a, a, a plan of the site uh, just to assist councillors. I mean, you may not be as familiar with the layout as we are. Uh, it, would, it would assist my description of the traffic situation if I could have a, um, a plan of the, the actual... The floor plan. The, the, sorry, the, the, the map of the streets, I meant. This one? Yeah, yeah. That, that's, yeah, that's, that's, that's okay. Thank, thank you very much. Yeah. Yes. Um, so you, you'll probably... I mean, the, the site, the location has been explained. Yes. On this map, Sydney Road is to the left, yes. Park Street is to the bottom, and Brunswick Road is to, is to the top. That's correct. Um, the developers, uh, and I should note that the traffic access and egress is in the bottom right-hand corner onto, um, onto Park Street. That's correct. That's correct. Um, now, it might be worth spending a little more time just explaining the layout. Um, to the bottom right of this um, plan is, is Bowen Crescent, which, mm. which follows the park, mm. and then... Um, Park Street continues along to the east, and at the left are the traffic lights of the intersection. Now, the, um, the application envisages that 50% of the traffic, uh, the, the only, this is the only access and egress of, of traffic uh, for the whole site. And, and, and I do note uh, in, in, uh, at the beginning that, that there's an ex acceptance that, that there are too many cars on, on this development, too many apartments. So one of the best ways to reduce the traffic impact is to reduce the size of the development and the number of car parks. So we, we accept that and, and, and acknowledge that. But um, it's the issue of traffic safety that I'd like to focus on and just understanding this in, in, in its fullest. Um, the vehicles, uh, the, the anticipation of the vehicles entering and accessing is that 50% will head um, West, sorry, to the, to the freeway. Right here. Uh, Twenty-five percent will head south through Princess Hill down Bowen Crescent, and the other twenty-five percent will head east along along Park Street. Now, um, this access is not very far from traffic lights on a very very busy intersection. The traffic light sequence is very complicated. There are left turn preferences. Mm -hmm. There are pedestrian crossings. Mm -hmm. um, so there's an enormous build up of traffic on that intersection and, and cars and indeed bicycles tend to race through the, the lights and often run the lights. So you've got a situation where there's vehicles coming uh, from the west along there and suddenly within about 80 meters of that intersection, cars will be stopping to turn left into this access. Mm. And there are, there's a cycle path that they have to cross, yes. to cycle lane that they have to cross to get into there. The same applies when they, when they come out because they're interrupting the traffic flow to the east, and particularly if they come out and then they want to turn right into Bowen Crescent, which is about 20 metres beyond that uh, egress point. Um, the situation, I think, is even more complex because there is a median strip in the middle, um, which isn't shown on this diagram, where cars are parked. So that means that... that if you consider this for people coming from the west to get in or coming from Bowen Crescent to get in, they have to go presumably left. They come up Bowen Crescent or they come east along Park Street. Then they have to negotiate somehow to get through the median strip to get access to this point because they have to come along, turn to get in. Now, that is extraordinarily dangerous to other uh, road users and particularly to cyclists again. Yes. Cross, crossing these bikes. You've made your point very well, Simon. Yes. I'll have to get you to start to finish up, but that's a very well-made point. Yeah. 
And the other point I'd like to make quickly is that there is an, an alternative route, and that is to put access and egress into Brunswick, Brunswick Road, Road from the north, which has happened in a number of developments along Brunswick Road to date. Thank, Thank you very you. much indeed, Thank Simon. You. Thank you for the very good summary. Oh, great. Great, I should say. Yes, Michael. Good evening, Mayor, evening. Councillors, Senior Officers, and Fellow Citizens. My name is Michael Pettit, and I'm here today representing the Protectors of Public Lands, Victoria, right. yep. specifically the fifth section of our charter to protect significant public open space, parks, neighborhoods, and heritage. Tonight, it is to speak against an unconscionable overdevelopment, not development, threatening Princess Park, one of Melbourne's greatest open spaces at the southern entrance to our municipality. So egregious is the overdevelopment at 699 stroke 701 Park Street that one can only wonder if the developers blushed while filling out the paperwork. Probably not. I concede that it's not easy to be a counselor or a senior <coughs> officer and to strike a balance among sometimes competing policy imperatives that you have to consider. Yes, Victoria as and local governments are under intense pressure to find new opportunities for developers to purchase, to, to uh, develop and permit uh, housing, rental and purchase housing to keep pace with developments here where apparently everybody would like to live. Yes, too, Moreland Council has set policy objectives to encourage <coughs> less cars and more use of public transport, share cars, bicycling, and pedestrian traffic, and commencement, commend you all for doing those. And where can these objectives be best achieved? Well, not at this overdevelopment. <coughs> we are here to ask that we have a height limit that will not overshadow any Princess Park at any time of the year. More uh, bicycle lockups and less car parking in this building. Also concerns shared by the city of Yarra. We are here to support the Melbourne Council objection to the development driven 14 uh, story building whose height will overshadow the northern end of Princess Park in midwinter, including the jogging track and mature historic elm trees that need every ray of light, light to remain healthy. We therefore ask that Moreland Council amend its overshadowing policy around parkland beyond just the spring equinox that through a lifeline to this particular developer to impinge on parkland. Developers don't need encouragement Trees and people do, because this developer's proposal is clearly an overreach. And uh, one other thing I will mention, and that is that um, we have been fighting long and hard against piecemeal um, uh, intrusions into Royal Park. And uh, um, could you imagine somebody uh, trying to intrude into the botanical gardens? Well, the history, history shows it happens far too frequently in Royal Park, <coughs> and places are temporary, and suddenly they become permanent. So that fight, too, is, going, is, is being waged. And then finally, I'd like to thank the mayor and councillors who came out to our area of Dodd Street in South uh, Brunswick when we, when we were asked for some help to look at some situations out there. And I commend you for doing that, and I'm expressing that on behalf of just not myself, but a lot of people in that neighborhood. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good evening. Um, my name is Naomi Matthews, and I'm, a, I'm speaking on behalf of quite a lot of people, basically the residents who are all living around the site. Uh, at least 20 senior elderly people mm. who aren't able to attend the meeting, mm. I'm speaking for them. So when I say we, I'm talking about a large majority of people, perhaps up to 50 thereabouts. Thank you. I'll Naomi. do my best to stay on time. Thank you very and, much. And um, I'll do my very best. So my name is Naomi Matthews. I live in Park Street, Brunswick. I'm a very long term <laughs> resident. I've been there approximately 28 years, and I know very well the residents in and around that area, as I say, particularly the seniors who live in and around the 699 proposed site. 
Um, I have, as I've said, I've been asked to speak on behalf of the residents that are here tonight. Um, I had planned to speak to, even before I was asked to speak, um, but for the reason being that I'm very concerned about two very frail elderly sisters who live on, in the house butting up to the site on Brunswick Road who will be subjected to 24-7 people traffic right outside their window. And these two ladies are beautiful old ladies mm. who I'm speaking, I also want to, to have their voices heard tonight yes. here. Okay, so up until this point, us arriving here, there's already been significant damage done by JW Land to the residents. Why this I mean, we have already suffered terribly by the developer even before this permit has even been discussed. On 10th of August last year, I received desperate phone calls from senior citizens around the site early in the morning when bulldozers and demolition teams moved onto the site and started to, to demolish what was already there. There was absolutely no warning, there was no permits put up, and the surrounding area was immediately covered in a thick layer of acidic dust. Residents at this point started to report itching eyes, coughing, induced asthma and headaches to the point where one child was actually taken to hospital. Then, after the dust had settled, there came a foul odour. It was like breathing in petrol and caused residents and the neighbourhood to fall ill. I work in the medical field, so I got to hear a lot of these symptoms that were being described. We all tried reporting to council and EPA and were sent in round and round in circles. No one wanted to accept responsibility. We were told to stay indoors, clean, clean down surfaces where food was being prepared, shut our windows, and to keep our windows closed and block all cracks. Unbelievable. The developer has rights over our health and our safety. Some time after this, the council said that the developer agreed to water the site on hot days as summer was, summer was progressing to prevent dust getting into our homes. But in spite of repeated requests, this never happened. We repeatedly continued to suffer each hot, windy day. Some residents, families, moved the elderly people away from their homes out of concern for their health. Then we were told that the developer would cover the site with clean soil to prevent the oily sludge that was rising to the surface um, on the site from being exposed. So JW Land covered the pool of sludge with a piece of old black plastic held down by a couple of a few rocks. And on the first gust of wind, the plastic blew and dislodged and again, residents were covered in dust breathing in toxic fumes. We now know that the site is highly contaminated with metals such as lead and with serious health risks. With this developer not having any concern for, the, for our community, JW Land have a history of total disregard for our community and non-compliance with regulations. They did not give notice of the plans according to the rules. No large yellow signs were, had ever appeared. A4 sized white photocopies were lodged in places that were inaccessible and were illegible from the street and were graffitied over and not replaced. And I note that on the date of expiry, they were quickly removed. They also put up the great black steel reinforced wall around the site and is known by the residents as the Great Wall of China to deter us from photographing, reporting the pools of oily sludge. They have deliberately excluded the heritage subzone station from the, the wall zone, leaving it open to vandalism. The large walled off site is now a haven and has been witnessed for drug deals and prostitution. I have received calls from distressed residents who have been forced to live with witnessing these activities. Our lovely peaceful residential area is now a, a derelict, dangerous, toxic and frightening turf for criminal activities. Neighbours no longer feel safe. All this because the site 
was bulldozed years before any <coughs> building could possibly start and in full knowledge of its contamination. And finally, the concerns of overshadowing are not just confined to the park, but the homes around the site. There are several adjoining and close by residents that have roofs covered with solar panels and gardens with vegetable plots, which are the delights of particularly the, the um, Italian and the Greek seniors. These homes will be completely overshadowed. And just to finish up, I return to my concern about the two frail ladies. Their home is completely 100% powered by solar panels. They are totally dependent on this power. They will lose their sunlight and be forced to live in the shadow of a monstrous overbearing development with loss of privacy and peace. There is no natural justice for elderly residents having to find money to re-engineer their electricity supply to, to satisfy the profit of developers. On behalf of all residents, seniors and not so seniors who live around the site, we want this proposal seriously changed to protect our right to the sunlight, the sky, our amenities, and to protect our health. It cannot be allowed to overshadow homes or the park at all. And lastly, I would just like to acknowledge and thank the Protect Park Street Precinct group that have been working with us, me, not just me, the residents, and guiding us through this process and how to do this, and for us to be here tonight to have this voice. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Naomi. We might just wait for all the objectors and I'll let you ask. Oh, you can ask it now. It's specifically to Naomi, is it? It's specific to this yeah, okay, objector. Um, thank you for talking about that, particularly about the contamination. Yes. I'm wondering if the residents ever found out exactly what the contamination was. Uh, through the Protect Park Street precinct group, they uh, did exhaust this and have gone through it. I can't speak about it because the, the documentation was just too complicated for me, but there are members who can speak about what exactly, and it is very contaminated. Is there the anyone who can answer that? You can come to the lectern and give it. Okay. okay. Um, after these terrible events, we did manage to get the EPA, and we really had to go uh, to the higher levels of the EPA yep. to get some action. Um, now, the two environmental audit reports that are available show that there are two categories of uh, contaminants. One are the heavy metals, mm -hmm. so it's lead, mercury, cadmium, antimony, blah, 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 and so forth. The other category is related to the oily sludge which comes from the underground petrol tanks. Yeah. It's got, um, it's called BTEX, which is benzene, toluene, mm -hmm. uh, ethylene, um, xylene, there's also naphthalene, and a whole range of other polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. Thank you. What the yeah. EPA has done is to issue what's called a clean-up notice, and this was really at our, our pressure, to issue a clean-up notice to the developer. By the end of next year, they are required to make a contour map. That is a three-dimensional map uh, going underground because the water table is also contaminated. Mm. It's to uh, give you a three-dimensional view of all the different contaminants. And at that stage, you, the developer would normally make a commercial decision as to what purpose could this site be used for. For example, if it's a childcare centre, it's a very high level of, uh, of uh, cleanup. Yeah. Uh, it's a lower level for a high rise and so forth. And so uh, thank you very that's much. where we are. Thank you very much indeed. Sorry, I've just got a quick question about... Mm. Um, do we know if, um, to the officers, if there was a permit for the demolition? There was. Hang on, we'll ask, I'll, I'll check. Do the officers know? Andy, do you, are you aware? I'm not aware of... Okay, I will go to the objector then. Um, okay. Yes, the, you come to the lectern if you wouldn't mind. Would you mind coming to the lectern oh, just so we could people at home know? Okay. So there was no, it was not posted till a week after most of the, uh, I was there and mm. asked them, do you have a permit for this? And one of the workmen pulled it out of his truck and stuck it up on right. the fence. Thank you very much. And Andy. that was several days after. Thank you. Week. Now I'll just go to any other objectors that haven't spoken and feel the need to speak. 
Okay, thank you. We'll, we'll leave the objections there and thank you for the way in which you presented those. Uh, extremely professionally done. Um, is there uh, the applicant or a representative of the applicant here tonight? No, I didn't think so. Okay, are we sure? No. Okay, that often happens when they've already decided to go to VCAT. That is a, a often happens in that case. All right, councillors. Okay, we've heard from the objectors. Councillors, do you have any questions? Further questions for officers? Officer, not the applicant, because they're not here, or objectors. Councillor Riley. Uh, could I just, could we ask the officers to clarify the issue around the the, uh, the height issue? I know there's some emails have gone around to us today as a result of that. And I just think, I mean, I could explain it, but I think it's actually better if we get a, an officer to explain it around the, the eight stories mm -hmm. and the DDO Do allowing you? up to 10 because um, it is pertinent and just to get some clarification. Fine. And it's one of the issues that we often deal with on this basis and it'd be good for the community to understand why we have this Victorian planning scheme. And it's something that we in Moreland have to implement and monitor. It's not something that we wish to have. It's your state government that does this for us. All right. Okay, Andy, are you able to answer that question? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Councillor Governor. Uh, yes, so as one of the objectors pointed out previously, uh, there is discretion within the planning control that uh, although there is a preferred height limit specified for the site, uh, and I will add that there's a number of height controls specified for this particular site, given the size of the site and its number of interfaces, there are uh, three or four different height controls that apply across the site, with the highest one being at 25 metres as a preferred height. <coughs> However, one of the objectives of the DDO itself is to encourage a mid-rise uh, development throughout the Brunswick Activity Centre, which ranges from a height of four to ten storeys. So there are sites within the Brunswick Activity Centre that have been considered suitable for heights of up to ten storeys. However, the, the DDO control itself doesn't specify a preferred height um, beyond 25 metres, which is approximately eight storeys. So there is a little bit of tension there, but there is discretion to consider heights above eight storeys and up to 10 storeys uh, as specified within the DDO. Thank you, Andy. All right, councillors, any further questions? If there's no further questions, can I have a mover of a motion? Councillor Riley's on his feet. Yes, Councillor Riley. I move the officer's motion. As, as right, the officer's recommendation. And do you want a second, Councillor Tapanos? Okay, so the officer recommendation is moved by Councillor Raleigh, seconded by Councillor Tapanos. Councillor Raleigh, would you like to speak to I it? certainly would. Um, I will try and be as brief as possible. This has given me and my fellow councillors quite a bit of grief and yourselves, and I think um, the whole process from these proponents and developers is quite shameful, the amount of energy and effort that they've um, managed to garner, which I think in some ways is a good thing, but unfortunately I think many of you have had to address something that really was never going to be accepted by us as a council if I was going to be involved in it. And um, we're still, we've actually got a result of that tonight where we're actually seeing something which is way too high, got far too many car parks, it's not activating our um, active transport, it's um, uh, neglecting our heritage in terms of the, the Brunswick um, electricity transfer station and also many of the amenity impacts. I could go on. It's been quite eloquently addressed by you and I thank the, the submitters tonight for many of the eloquent um, presentations you've made. In terms of open space, there was a question around that. I can assure you we've been spending a lot of time and energy on our open space in our city and if you've been, as a resident, I urge you to actually have a look at our, uh, our parks close to home and we are actually um, amassing quite an amount of um, uh, uh, contributions from developers to <coughs> reacquire open space in our city to address um, the, the pressures on South Brunswick. So I, I, it's actually quite aside from tonight, so I think it'd be good to take that offline and have a word with you outside of this. In regards to the air, air and dust and the pollution for the site, that's created quite a lot of flurry within council. And I have to say shamefully that the laws in this state are disgusting and the lack of clarity around council's roles and the state government's roles are nothing, nothing short of shameful. And the runaround that you've been given is absolutely disgusting. And I think you need to take this up to your MPs into this state election because it's actually woeful. It's, and you've actually spoken quite well to this and it's actually quite a nightmare. We had a presentation as councillors on this and I just say it's absolutely confusing it's, it's nothing short of disgusting and it needs to be sorted out at our state level, unfortunately. 
again, we as council end up um, having to implement that. So just returning to the application, I, I think the officers have really um, hit on many of the issues around setbacks and height and so on. The issues around um, overshadowing and loss of light are not pr well protected under the scheme. Again, that's your state government that have, doesn't allow that. Your rights um, to, to solar access, to growing your trees and plants and to protecting our parks and open spaces are very limited. And I think that's another issue that we as a council will be advocating on. We already are and we will continue to advocate on those issues. So I, I um, really commend the officers for the work they've done on this. It, it was a shocker when they announced it and went public without even tabling at council and got everybody's backs up before they'd even given it to officers or got any advice about how it mismatched our, our plan. Time We've counselor. all been living with it ever since and I'm looking forward to going, going to VCAT. Thank you very <laughs> much indeed, Councillor Roth. Thank you for that passionate address, Councillor Rowley. Thank Second you, thank you Councillor Mr Tuckers. Mayor. Um, I also rise to speak in favour of the refusal of this planning application. Um, and, and I think a lot of the points have been adequately addressed tonight, so I'll to be brief. Um, but quite often we stand here and we say that planning um, involves difficult decisions. Well, can I say this is not a difficult decision tonight? It's probably one of the most easiest ones I've had to make because I have not seen an application that is this poor. I have not seen an application before and a developer before which treats the planning scheme with utter contempt and also likewise with the residents and also some of the councillors. So this um, has been going on now for, for a number of years. It's been advertised. Um, publicly apartments have been advertised without plans and there really hasn't been, in my view, a, a, a serious attempt to try to close some of the gaps. So um, when we're talking about heights, yes, we do have our structure plan heights and our DDO18, which talks about 25 metres and that is the maximum. Um, yes, it is um, unfortunately um, a discret discretionary control and we've been campaigning for 10 years to try to yeah. change that. But it also talks about allowing a height that might be above that if it is exemplary, if it shows some really good design features, either in ESD or in good quality materials, it should be a very rare circumstance. <coughs> that is not what we're seeing here. We're seeing um, a, an application which has none of that and wants almost double the heights. So that is not really taking us and residents and the process serious. Um, it's just saying that we want to maximise our profits and fit as many dwellings as we possibly can. So, so I'm urging my fellow councillors for us to all reject this tonight. I'm not even going to talk about traffic, which I think the resident mentioned very um, well before, because that's going to be a nightmare if these, these amounts of densities are allowed into this precinct or the impact on, on, um, on the park. Um, particularly the walking track on the park as well. So, I mean, these are very, very important issues. But um, beyond that, what we need to make a decision here tonight and send a really loud message is that we're going to fight this right through to VCAP because it's completely unacceptable. And when you come to Moreland and you want to develop in our city, we expect the best and we expect that to be within the height controls. Thank you. Thank you. OK, I'll... Uh, okay, um Fine, you can put the amendment. I'd like to move an amendment, um, if councillors are prepared to back me, to add an extra ground of objection, point eight, uh, lack of a statutory environmental audit on the site. Okay. Can we get some information from the officers? Yeah, do you want to comment on that? I'll just go to the acting um, manager just for a comment on that, group manager. Thank you, through the chair. Um, the applicant, there is an um, environmental audit overlay that affects part of the site and the applicant would be required, if a permit were to issue, um, would be required to undertake a, an environmental audit. They're not required to have that work done up front as part of a planning permit application. Did you still want to move it, Councillor Bolton, or would I you have to withdraw? I would, um, and it needs to have environmental in front of audit between statutory and Statutory audit. and environmental audit. Okay, so that's moved second, by Councillor... I can explain That's why. right. Moved by Councillor Bolton. Is there any seconder to that? You're seconding? Yeah. Okay, Councillor Bird seconding. You may speak to it now, Councillor Bolton, because you so have been... The reason for um, moving this, uh, partly because of 
started to gain a bit more um, knowledge about the process of environmental audits and so forth because I'm involved with a um, contaminated site in Faulkner. Um, at the moment, the developer has provided two um, environmental assessments, which I, site assessments, which I haven't seen. Um, but that is not the same as a, an environmental audit. Um, and there has been, um, the report says that the EPA has ordered a clean-up of the site, but unless there's been an environmental audit um, that's been conducted, then um, you don't really know what you're protecting, have to protect the community against. And that's why I would like to see this included, and maybe it isn't a requirement, but it alarmed me hearing one of the objectors talking about the demolition happening without people being aware, then there's pungent odour, um, no one was really aware of the, you know, what the impacts of that are. Um, the fact that they didn't take very good protective measures with um, with um, dealing with this uh, toxic situation. I mean, it seems to me that um, that ought to be a prerequisite before there's even demolition on the site. There should be some sort of assessment of the site. So, I mean, I sort of feel like, um, you know, something like this does need to be in the motion. Thank you, Councillor. Is there a second you'd like to speak? Um, yeah, I'd, I'd just like to commend this um, extra point and have explain um, my support for it, which is also to do with my experience with uh, the contaminated site in Faulkner, um, which <coughs> went to VCAT and is still playing out and we don't have a result back and that's going to take quite a lot of time to unpack because environmental issue, issues and contamination are very complex and um, half the time we don't even know what the chemicals are that we're talking about when we say them, let alone the impacts they have, or how long it takes for these things to actually have an impact, um, what, their, what their life is in the ground before, you know, and how to um, clean up these areas. So I, even though I understand that um, the permit application doesn't need to have an environmental audit um, to be approved or refused, I think it's very important to support the kind of language that is going to encourage a clean site. Um, we're talking about vegetable gardens, we're talking about kids, we're talking about the park and we're also talking about you know lead and some hideous toxic chemicals that I can't even remember the names of and I don't think that um, we should be you know treading lightly with this stuff so I, have, I commend that amendment. Okay do we have any speakers against the amendment? Can I, can I, um, can I just ask for clarification again because this doesn't seem to make sense because um, we, we're already asking for this as part of the as part of the um, the process, I'm, I'm try, trying to understand I'll, what we're doing. I'll, I'll get the acting manager to explain the position again. So, if a um, through the VCAT process, it was determined um, that a planning permit were to issue, one of the conditions of the planning permit would be the completion of an environmental audit. Um, it's not a um, mandatory information requirement as part of a planning permit application. Mm. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Um, we're, in, we're in community now, so I'm sorry. Um, can you, know, you can ask a question, yes. Um, when you're talking about the environmental audit, um, is there a difference between asking for a statutory environmental audit and, a, and an environmental audit? For the purpose of the, the ground that's been recommended, no. Sorry, I just need to clarify this. Um, so if um, this goes to the next stage without that, would we be asking for a statutory environmental audit as part of the application or just an environmental audit? Because I believe there's a difference. Um, it's, it's my understanding that there isn't a difference. Um, an environmental audit is required um, under a clause of um, the Environment Protection Act. So in that sense, it's a statutory environmental audit, but our standard wording in, in conditions is to ask for an environmental audit pursuant to the particular section of the Environment Protection Act. Okay. Can I ask the question as I move the amendment? I'm sorry? Could I respond to the question as I move the amendment? Uh, to the question? Oh, uh, the question okay. raised by Council. Yes, okay, I'll... all right, I'll let you do that, yeah. My reason for raising this is that um, what the EPA is saying is that um, they're only asking for an environmental audit if a permit is granted. Okay. Okay. 
Me putting this forward is um, indicating that an environmental audit ought to be done prior to a permit being granted. That's why I. That's why I put that forward. Okay, I'm going to speak against the motion. The the motion. And I'll explain why to the amendment. That is. So we're talking about the amendment only at this point. I'm speaking against the amendment because I believe that the seven uh, conditions that we have in the in the officer recommendation are very strong recommendation. A very strong. A, we can argue well at BCAT. I do think that if we put in things that are not required by the applicant at this point, I think it actually weakens our position at BCAT. I think it's, I think it, I'm not, that's not to say I'm not deeply concerned with the behaviour of the applicant at this point in time, but I do want to make sure that we go to BCAT with the strongest possible um, recommendation that we can. And I do believe that immediately the tribunal member could say, Listen, we know that that's at later stage. That weakens council's position, so move on. That's the only thing that concerns me, and so I'll be voting against the amendment. Anyone else want to speak for for the amendment? Speaking against. Okay, okay so I'll just see if there's another speaker for. Okay, you may speak against. I've just, in terms of the comments I made earlier, I believe the issues that have been raised and the dangers that the community have already put out have actually been unleashed already. This will not actually address that in any way. I think my point was earlier about making advocacy to our state government about improving the condition, particularly the rights that owners of these properties have in terms of demolishing their sites and unleashing um, chemicals and other waste and other things that are dangerous to our communities. That's not something that we can necessarily address in the, during the planning process, but I do believe it's something as a council we are trying to address. I, I did say earlier that we've actually, it unleashed quite a few issues around the complexities between us and the EPA and it needs to be addressed. So I'm not saying it doesn't need to be addressed, I just don't think this is a useful way and I agree with the arguments that we need to have very clear arguments that are going to VCAT and it's already been picked up. If it were to be issued, this would happen as a matter of course. Unfortunately, it doesn't address the issue for the, what's happened in between the demolition time and now and unfortunately I don't think this is going to fix it either. Okay, are there any other speakers for or against the amendment? Okay, then I'm, I'm going to put the amendment. So, uh, councillors, just to be clear, we're only voting on the amendment at this point. All those in favour of the amendment? All those against? I declare the amendment lost. We move back to the substantive motion, which was moved by Councillor Riley, seconded by Councillor Tapanos. Do I have any speakers for or against the substantive motion? Yep, uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, okay, so. I, I, want to, I will absolutely be supporting the refusal. Um, what I want to do is I want to thank everyone for their advocacy and for their determination and implore you to hang in there and also to remember that the officers and all of us are under quite a bit of pressure with this stuff but our intentions are, are good, um, I truly believe, and that we are on the same page because it's really easy to disagree with people or um, feel frustration or whatever and... It's, it's easy to forget that at the end of the day, we're all just people who go home and want to read a story to our kids or whatever, eat Vegemite on toast or whatever it is. Um, and so I just, because I've been to VCOT on a few of these issues um, and I'm beginning to understand a little bit the process, um, I think that it's really important that um, you understand from my perspective, I understand the implications of this type of development on the city. The idea of you know, Paris or Amsterdam and four storeys where the poets and the, and the actors live on the fourth floor because they can't afford to live on the bottom floor because they have to walk up the stairs is something that I think would be ideal. But we're dealing with something different. We're dealing with eight storeys, ten storeys, car elevators, a whole lot of different stuff. But, but certainly for me personally, I understand what a great outcome we could have for the city, which is growing at a rate of knots that I don't think any of us can understand, and the process is not exactly straightforward. Um, I hope that the planning minister watches our meetings online because he might understand how important the park, the neighbourhood, the fact that we have you know elderly people and kids and everyone in between living in these neighbourhoods. This is not a pot of money, it's somebody's home, and I think that you, I hope that all of us remember that the council and the planning officers know, are aware of that. So I, I thank you for your advocacy and ask you to hang in there. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, speaking in favour or in favour of the motion? Yes, Councillor Bolton. 
Well, I think it is very important that councillors reject this development application tonight and support this, um, this motion. Um, but I also think we need to think about the question of when the developer takes this to VCAT because quite often there are compromise proposals put forward. And I think, um, you know, while it's very important that Council uh, rejects this um, development, including the 14-storey development uh, tower, it's also important that um, we recognise that the developer is probably arguing an ambit claim, hoping that um, even if the 14-storey development doesn't get up, that there might be a bit of argy bargy at VCAT and they might not get, well, they might not get exactly what they really like, they can come down a couple of levels, but really it's still, so it looks like they've compromised and really the community's lost out. Um, so I think the point that the object, one of the objectors made about discretion, um, not only meaning preferred heights or higher than preferred heights, but also even discretion being um, is the height appropriate for um, the space. I think that is um, an important argument, as well as the argument about um, the sh overshadowing of Prince's Park, not just whether it's massively extensive in winter, but even, um, you know, smaller levels of overshadowing are still uh, very serious given that it is passive open space. So I'd certainly hope that the council um, in the arguments at VCAT and, and likely compulsory conferences and all of those sorts of things um, does not, um, you know, comes, uh, does not agree to something which is maybe just a little bit uh, lower than the 14 storeys, but, you know, it still is something which is uh, far higher than residents really want and, and similarly with the overshadowing issue, which I think is really, really serious, um, a really serious uh, issue. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. And Councillor Parton. Thanks very much. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming tonight. Um, I did attend a few of these meetings before I came to Council um, in this role, so I um, understand how, uh, how anxious you might be feeling at this moment, but I can assure you um, I'm standing up to uh, vote fully uh, refusing this uh, application. <laughs> Listen, I I'll be brief. We have to deal with this stuff a lot. It our planning system is completely broken at the moment. You have the lack of clarity. You have VCAT continually ignoring councils and residents. Um, you have the under-enforcement of EPA. And, you know, we deal with this again and again and again. We have a developer that comes in, Building's too high, it's dog boxes, poor ESD, poor amenity, poor heritage. We stand here, we say the same thing, we refuse it, goes to VCAT, VCAT says, oh yeah, compromise decision, gives them exactly what Councillor Bolton was saying, something that's um, not quite, you know, where our scheme sits, but because it's discretionary and because you can argue these things, they get sort of a, a mediated approach because of the ambit claims. <coughs> We need to change this system that we're in and at the moment as councillors we can't change that because in order to change anything we require permission from the state government. The planning minister, and I think a few of you are probably from Richmond, um, in, in his seat refuses to meet with Moreland Council. We have a situation where we can't change anything in our scheme unless the state government agree with us. And where are the state members? Well, I haven't seen any of them in months. This is the issue that we're up against. And we're only a council. And we can write as many letters as we want. We can stand up here and bag out the state government as much as we want. But unless everyone here in the crowd actually picks up the phone, contacts their state member and says, why is this the way that it is? Nothing's going to change. So I thank you all for coming tonight. But this is a plea to please contact your state member and ask them why our planning system is broken and is the way it is. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Is there any further discussion? Jess. Jess? Oh, sorry, Councillor Dorney. Sorry. Uh, thank you. I also rise um, to support the officer recommendation of a refusal this evening for all the reasons um, that councillors have already um, mentioned. I won't 
I won't repeat any points, but I would like to just bring uh, attention to a comment that Adrian Clark made, or a statement rather, that, that this development is, will have a detrimental impact on the health and well-being of our residents. And I think that is huge. And it encompasses not only social health, not only physical health, but mental health. Our ability to connect with each other, our ability to undergo the things we want to do each day, the ability to live in a house or an apartment that actually provides our energy needs and doesn't require our whole income to just heat and cool the place. I think, you know, the beloved Princess Park and the overshadowing of those trees, which are lungs for our city. This is just, it's unconscionable, as Michael said. It's unacceptable and I'm completely baffled that the developer, that we're even at this point, they're completely out of touch, completely out of touch with the current community and completely out of touch with the community that we want to see moving forward in Moreland air quality, the amount of car spaces that they've actually proposed and little bike spaces means that they're saying yes to a congested moorland where the air quality is poor. I think, um, so I thank Adrian for really highlighting the health and wellbeing impacts that this development has and I think that is a huge consideration in the work of council and also an obligation of state government as well to make sure that we are meeting the public health and wellbeing needs of our community. Um, I would just quickly like to also thank you all and all the others who haven't been able to make it tonight for your ongoing persistence and strength in times as adverse as such. I know that while the situations haven't been great, I'm sure that it's actually brought a lot of you together more and I'm sure you've created some really nice friendships that will go on long beyond the bad memory of this development, I hope. So um, I also would like to implore you to uh, contact state <coughs> ministers and this is, a, this is bigger than us. Although we do have the power, power as community and, and power as council, as, as a tier of government, this do, a lot of this does fall with the state government and um, it's not acceptable and we need your voice as much as ours in this advocacy and lobbying work. I want to say a couple of words, um, particularly in answer to the resident who mentioned that if it is refused, that we defend this vigorously. I assure you that that will happen. Um, this, you know, sometimes people underrate council's position. I think it's very important that even though the applicant has gone uh, to VCAT for failure to uh, to make a decision in 60 days, council's decision tonight is a very important decision because it means whether we march with the objectors or whether we march with the applicant. And obviously from the discussion we're hearing tonight, it looks as though it's coming down on the side of the objectors without preempting the decision. That means that our resources will be used to defend this decision, right? And as they should, right? Um, much has been made about Princess Park and I concur with that. But what about Royal Parade? What about, uh, along with St Kilda Road, they are the two great boulevards of Melbourne and this is the entry point Right, of Moreland from those two great boulevards. This must be defended and must be defended vigorously and I'm confident that it will. Okay, so in saying that, we'll put this to the vote. All those in favour of the refusal? Against? Declare that carried unanimously. All right. Now, just before you make your way, I'll ask the officer to explain what the process is from here. Thank you, Councillor Kavanagh. So, uh, Councillor has resolved to uh, that its position at VCAT be that the application be refused on the grounds uh, included in the agenda. Uh, so, as noted earlier, an appeal has already been lodged by the applicant, and uh, everyone who's made a submission to Moreland Council will be re will receive notification from VCAT if you haven't already uh, about the appeal and those uh, relevant dates. Uh, if you're uncertain about that process, I'm happy to discuss with you uh, at another time. But uh, in summary, the compulsory conference is set down for the 17th of September uh, and a five day hearing to commence on the 12th of November. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andy. And I'll, um, we're about to deal with the next item. So if you want to leave now, you're welcome to do so. And thank you for your attendance tonight. We'll give it a moment or two before the next item. <laughs> Thank you.
Oh, thank you. Good on you. Thanks, Lynn. Oh. All right, councillors, we're still in the meeting, so we'll just give it a few more moments. Uh, I think there'll be a few. Uh, <coughs> yeah. Now, be in the one for sure. All right, councillors, we're moving to the next item. We only have two items tonight, but they're both big items. The next item is DED 4118, which is three, three to five Centennial Avenue, Brunswick West, Brunswick West, modifications to approved apartment development. Now, I'll move to the officers to present the report, and I'll just give you a moment before you do. Uh, thanks. Lachlan, we'll just let everyone sit. Okay, Lachlan, I'll ask you to begin to present. Thank you and good evening. This is an application at 3 to 5 Centennial Avenue in Brunswick West. The application is for modifications to an approved three-storey apartment building. The subject site is located in the neighbourhood residential zone, Schedule 1, and is also affected by the development contributions plan overlay, Schedule 1. By way of background, the development was approved by planning permit MPS slash 2013 slash 309, which was issued at the direction of VCAT. Um, minor changes were then approved when plans were submitted for endorsement in January 2016. The plans were further amended in October 2017, pursuant to secondary consent provisions. It's also worth noting that the development has commenced and is nearing completion. As far as the proposal goes, various amendments to the approved development are proposed, including the following notable changes. Modifications to the east-facing bedroom window of dwelling 1.02, the addition of roofing above the south-facing balconies at second floor level, an increase in the extent of second floor wall adjacent to the balcony of dwelling 2.02, the provision of a screen to the rooftop plan area. Approval of these modifications is sought retrospectively, with the exception of the modification to the window of dwelling 1.02, which is currently being uh, incorrectly constructed as a door. In terms of public notice, um, there's an image up on the screen now showing when notice was given and the objections received. A total of 17 objections were received. Issues included the level of change just occurred since the VCAT uh, approval and also the impact on the amenity of adjoining properties. Key planning considerations for this application are the impact on the proposed window, the impact of the proposed window modifications on One Centennial Avenue, the bulk and shadowing impact of, of the balcony modifications, the additional height resulting from the addition of rooftop screening. In terms of uh, the impact on uh, privacy of One Centennial Avenue, this is the, the window that's been incorre incorrectly constructed as a door that I referred to earlier. Um, The endorsed plans currently show that as the window circled there in blue, um, the proposed plans show that as a slightly larger window, still with uh, obscure glazing up to a height of 1.7 metres above floor level, which complies with the overlooking requirements of the planning scheme. Also still on 1 Centennial Avenue, uh, there's an additional section of wall proposed at the very top level, shown here with the red arrow. This is it in plan form. The endorsed plans show, you can see a cutout at the top level there, whereas the current proposal proposes to fill this in. The officer recommendation is to revert back to the endorsed plans for this matter. In terms of the visual bulk impact on the two properties at the rear, 40 and 42 Hallis Street, um, the main impact is from the addition of roof forms above the, the second level balconies. Council officers recommend this is an appropriate change 
based on the fact that it complies with the res code side and rear boundary setback standard and also complies with the overshadowing standards of res code. I mentioned earlier the rooftop screen. You can see that showing the elevation form there in pink um, and the extensive screen shown on the right hand side of the, of the page. Um, the officer recommendation is to reduce uh, the height of that screen and also the extent in terms of the area that it covers. So in conclusion, it's recommended that council issue a notice of, notice of decision to grant an amended planning permit subject to the conditions of the conditions requiring the following deletion of the proposed change to the EC wall LE 2.02 and a reduction in the height and extent of the rooftop screen. Thank you very much indeed. Are there any objectors who wish to submit? Yes, please come forward to the lectern and then after. Between two of this timeline. <coughs> Hello, and um, thank sorry, you for if you just say your name thank and Thank you for uh, hearing me stroke. today. My name is Janet Watson Cruz. Yes. And I'm resident at One Centennial Avenue. Thank you very much, Janet. On the eastern side of this development. Thank you. Um, and I have some photos to show you, and I'm really hoping they can access them from yep. the USB. Okay. So, uh, number one, this is the side balcony as VCAT uh, described it. So they're numbered one, two, three, four. So hopefully we can get through it. So, 2013. There were 17 houses on our side of the street and only one of them was two-storey. Um, they proposed to put 20 apartments on two suburban blocks, which more than doubled the number of houses on our side of the street. So, Jan, just uh, looking at that, I think it's going to be, be in a slightly different format for some way. I don't think we're going to be able to open those. But, I'm sorry? Are they? Uh, I've okay. got some. It might be an issue. Right. I've printed out some photographs. Yes, right. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So, um, this was between two planning schemes. We objected and went to VCAT yes. Council. Um, that it, the permit was granted, basically on the um, <coughs> on on the basis that we had had a really significant rear setback. Um, they've added some very. We, in September last year, we noticed they were building something different mm. to what went to VCAT. Yes. So we contacted council and had a very long and complicated correspondence with them. Officers came out and um, what, we saw, what we saw happening was that they'd roofed the rear balconies and then had put a wall all the way down the side. Um, and after we raised that objection, they then requested secondary consent to do what they'd already done. So this is what we saw. We saw this... The roof, the, the wall all the way down the side. And we also saw something which <coughs> hadn't been documented anywhere, which was huge steel beams take all the way Take your time, Janet. Back. I'm going to give you more than three minutes. So yeah, thanks. Sorry, I meant to say I'm representing a number of people. I've, I realise that. Who's not so here. Um, he's overseas. Yep. So um, we contended that we should have been informed about this because mm. it had it's 5.6 metres by um, 1.3 metres, the gap, the, the, the open balcony to the closed balcony. Secondary consent was granted for half of that balcony to be um, cut, walled in, um, and but, but then council came to the conclusion that there hadn't been proper documentation of the roofing, so that's why they're bringing it to us today. So um, I, I contend that uh, that the I, I respectfully disagree that the roofing should be retrospectively approved. The substantial setback from the rear was an important factor in the VCAT members' determination to approve the building. The building creep is inappropriate in the developer's blatant disregard for the planning system in Victoria and Mullen Council's planning department and shouldn't be rewarded. Just because they've built it and it's there doesn't mean it should be approved. We're already hugely impacted by this and to add to the shadowing of our garden is unacceptable to us. While the shadowing may fall within the letter of res code, we do not see why they should be able to take even more of our sunlight just because we have such a big garden, because it only fulfills the standard because our garden is so large. And that doesn't seem to me to be fair. It seems to me that they're taking and not giving. We respectively submit that the rear balcony should be open, as submitted to VCAT, without the dominating steel bulkheads, which we believe have still not been flagged as a substantial change to plans. I don't see it listed anywhere, or flagged, or numbered. We submit that the spiral staircase was not adequately documented at VCAT and is overkill because it's labelled for maintenance purposes and it takes up a quarter of the rear balcony. Um, I submit that the endorsement of the side wall, the half walling in of the side wall to a back rear balcony, has the same shadow impact on our garden 
as the unapproved roof and should be treated in the same way. The VCAT plans approved for an open balcony with a side wall to 1.7 metres for privacy. We submit that the applicants relied heavily on the width of the planter boxes being one metre in the extensive discussion at VCAT. This, they were very persuasive. Their QCs that they took to VCAT, three of them, argued that one metre balcony with balcony boxes were a very good solution for overlooking. And they've been reduced to 750 mils in this. The recommendation before Council contrasts with the VCAT member's determination that the size and articulation of the setback was one of the reasons she endorsed the plans, and I quote, and this is my last thing that I'll say. Is that all right? Hmm. I find the design that includes the upper level recessed from the lower levels to all elevations and considerable setbacks to the front and rear will limit the prominence <coughs> of the third level. Contrast that with the pictures you see of the prominent third level. The building will bring, and she was weighing these different planning codes, this against that. And she was going, oh. And she said, the building will bring substantial change to the current outlook experienced from the private secluded open space, several habitable room windows, and an upper level of the adjoining dwellings to the immediate east and west. That's us. In the context of change being sought under the planning scheme, I find the outcome acceptable having regard to the following matters. There is considerable articulation of the eastern and western elevations mm -hmm. created by varied setbacks to side and rear boundaries and the use of diverse finishes. Importantly, the significant rear setbacks of the upper levels limit the impact of built form extending the length of the site. Now, when a VCAT member says that she has weighing two things, but importantly, the significant rear setback is one of the reasons she's made the determination, I believe that it does not um, fulfil the conditions of the permit to add 5.6 metres by 1.3 metres, more, more side wall to the balcony and more shading on our, our gardens. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And apologies for the uh, inability no, to show, no. but you've presented it very well. Do you have any other? Yes, sir. Hi, um, Mayor, Deputy Mayor and Councillors. Thank you for, uh, for listening. Um, I'm Tony Marutza from 42 Hall Street, West Brunswick. Um, I'm also talking on behalf of some of the other residents in Grantham and um, Haller Street, so thank you for taking the time. <clears throat> We're long-term residents. Um, while we do not oppose development in the area um, and increased density, we did oppose this original development, as, as Janet's already um, covered. Uh, what we did do is ask that it respects our privacy and our neighbourhood character. <clears throat> while we didn't like it, it was approved, uh, we move on. Um, we accept the uh, decision by VCAT. Uh, but disappointingly to find uh, our own, you know, through Janet and ourselves, um, significant changes have occurred, um, <clears throat> effectively pushing the envelope and further disrespecting our privacy and the neighbourhood character as detailed in, the, in our objections. Uh, it was only through our actions that the issues, and particularly Janet, that um, that the issues and modifications have been formally requested now. So the original submission had some five uh, items. Now it's up to 13 items um, now with council intervention. Despite process and compliance not being followed and a lack of clarity of what has actually happened, I'm still not clear. Janet's got a better handle on it than I do, but we're just not clear on what was approved, what wasn't approved. Um, it's, it's very confusing. Now, we do object to the, the changes, um, largely based on, again, the impact on our privacy and the, the neighbourhood character and the visual bulk um, of the development, and in particular, you know, the beam, the roofing, the additional bulk, um, the shadowing it, it has, and I know it talks about the equinox and the shadowing, but we have an all-year-round garden. This winter, it's obscured. Things aren't growing. Um, the spiral staircase, again, leading to the rooftop area, uh, further causing overshadowing and on the other side, you know, solar panels are clearly visible um, where it should be in an enclosed area. Solar panels are great, just in the right spot. The addition of fencing or screening on the rooftop, which again adds additional bulk, effectively um, the per uh, perceived view of a fourth level. Um, and again, the impact on privacy given that, you know, it could be used as an open entertainment area. We further raise the issue of the screening. Now, again, there's some technicalities, whether it's compliant or not compliant, but, you know, for those that have seen it, you can see directly into our toilet, into our backyard, um, into our living space, and, again, it might be compliant, but all we ask is respect for our privacy. 
Uh, approval by VCAT took place um, <clears throat> while the rezoning was being assessed and the amendments, I guess what, what we're asking for is that the amendments do take consideration of zone the zone one that, that um, the area is in. And again, Janet covered some of the points. While VEC had approved the original plans, some specific points they raised, point 33, the variety of setbacks at each level, the modulation provided by balcony elements and the range of external finishes will avoid the, period, the appearance of unbroken building bulk when viewed from the south, unquote. Point 26, again from the VCAT report, I find the design that includes the upper level recessed from the lower levels to all elevations and considerable setbacks to the front and rear will limit the prominence of the third level, unquote. Point 32, again from the VCAT report, acknowledging the significant change to the outlook from the adjoining properties to the south that again must be considered. So again, these amendments further compromise the points raised by VCAT um, and further impact the impact to the neighbours and we ask that they are taken into account. Um, you know, again, from day one, we please ask that you consider the neighbourhood and the impact to our homes and privacy, um, in particular our privacy. Again, thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Tony. Any other objectors like to speak? I'm John Wentworth from 27 Centennial yep. Avenue, yep. and I am certainly very concerned about the personal cost to uh, to Janet in particular yep. and Tony. Yep. But I think more broadly, I'm very concerned that you know this is we're sort of if we let this slip, where things have been the, the rules have been set, they've been broken, and there hasn't really been justification, or it's not been fair for them to be broken. I really object to that being let to get away. I mean, I don't. I don't know how frequently this happens in the in the in the city, but I, I that is something that really irks me, and I I really do strongly object to people not following the rules as we have done. Thank you very much. Any other objectors would like to speak? Okay. Are there representatives of the applicant here? No? Yeah. Would you like to speak? Yes, thank you. My name's Chris McKenzie. I'm a planning consultant who's uh, had some uh, level of involvement just in the recent months as the application has come before the council and gone through the public notice process. So you weren't in the, involved in the original application? I, I was involved peripherally in the original application, but I wasn't involved in the VCAT process right. okay. that led to its uh, approval. Thank but you. To, to the extent that I'm, I'm familiar with the application having existed and what it was proposing going back three, four, five years, and I've been familiar with this current process in, in much greater detail over the past several months. The, it's, it's obviously very difficult to try and communicate a complex amount of information in this very compressed time. It's also I'll, very I'll give you difficult. a bit of time, soon as it's... Uh, yeah. It's also very difficult to go through and correct what we would say are minor inaccuracies or, or minor discrepancies in what we all understand uh, is a confusing and complicated process. And I I'm might be wrong, but I think we'd call them discrepancies. I don't think we'd call them minor or major, we'd just call them discrepancies. Anyway, go on. Just in the I'll let you speak. It's very difficult to go and do that process. What we do acknowledge is that it is confusing because in almost every application, and particularly in an apartment type application, you'll have a process where a permit gets issued. Sometimes it's issued directly by council, sometimes <coughs> it's issued by VCAT. That in itself is not a big difference other than where the, where the sentiment lay in terms of council's attitude to the application. But in almost every application, there will then be a condition one process where your planning permit that gets issued says, the final plans that will be built must be generally in accordance with this and must have the following set of changes prepared for review by your officers and endorsement. There's a very clear expectation that the process involves some changes. There's also a facility separate to that, to actually come back to the council and discuss new changes through what's called secondary consent, which is an unadvertised process where the council consider a set of variations. Sometimes it's your fire services engineer, your drainage engineer, it's the building surveyor who says, we need to do some adjustments. Your planners have capacity and power to assess and approve them on the basis that they're satisfied, they're appropriate, and they don't have the type of planning impact that should be referred back to the community. There is also a process where changes that would have that type of impact get referred back out. In this particular case, Condition 1 plans were endorsed and changes were supported and approved by your officers. 
another application for secondary consent with a separate set of changes was approved by your officers. And that happened, the application itself was made about 18 months ago. It was approved about <coughs> nine months ago in October last year. And they are the current officially approved endorsed plans. I'm just going to interrupt her though. The, one, yes. the images we saw here though uh, yes. take that into account, don't they? The images that we saw presented by the officer early on are the ones that have been approved and, and what you're proposing in here. Uh, am I correct? Yeah, yes, yes, right. to, to exactly. a degree, because what, what if I come down to the detail, if you go back to that, that photo, this is jumping ahead in what my presentation is, that has been approved and is on the endorsed plans, that oh, rooftop sorry, balcony. Can, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Can we just... Sorry, I'm just... Moving at the balcony. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Sorry, uh, uh, please. Can we just go back to the previous one? Uh, sorry. So when we're talking about this, when we say the endorsed plans, these are the ones that have uh, currently been approved, because that's correct, isn't it? Through that process that you mentioned. Yeah, so you're, yes. you're blocking it, but yeah, that's this endorsed plan, so, this is what so right yes. Now. So that's the correct. important point is yes. that the ones that are on display, we're accepting that, yes, there's yes. been some yes. negotiation, yes. but in, even after that negotiation, it still doesn't it still doesn't comply with what was agreed. Are we correct? Yeah, there's, there's, a, right. set of, there's a set of further changes that we're seeking approval yeah, for. Yeah, that's right, now. exactly. That's, that's yeah, retrospectively. Okay, thank you, Colin. Some of the changes Sorry. are actually going to be new works because they've come out of the discussion process. So there are five elements that have gone out uh, under this Section 72 application process. The change to the apartment 102 window, which was referred to as a door. I have sat here and checked with the architect. It is not a door, but it looks like a door. Through the discussion process, it will be replaced with a different window to make it both functionally and visually clear, sorry, apparent, not clear because it will be frosted, visually apparent that it is not a door. There's also a note on the plans that says there will be no access to this roof other than for maintenance, which is the situation for every roof that it is for maintenance purposes. So there's been a discussion that has led to your officers recommending and requesting us to prepare the plan to show something different to specifically resolve a concern. Uh, when we go down to the next item on our list of the 2.01 window, it is simply a highlight window being converted to a narrow vertical window that is fully frosted. So again, there's no overlooking concern there. The issue that has been raised around the shadow and the bulk of the infilling of the side of the balcony at the rear, your planners have recommended as part of an overall recommendation to you to approve a suite of changes to not approve that change. So there will be work done to undo some of that infilled wall back to what is endorsed now. We accept that. We will make that change as your officers have requested, which is largely what has been asked for for the benefit of the neighbour to take down the wall back to 1.7 for the section that has not yet been approved by Council. So part of the officer's assessment has been a very careful balancing of all of the factors that wouldn't usually need notice, things that have been done that have caused concern, and they have made changes, or they are requiring changes to the plans from those put to you to ensure the balance is struck appropriately. I'm going to give you one more minute. Uh, you, you can, thank you. Mm. And there's the fourth of the five elements is a change in colour from a mid-grey to a light grey, which no one has mentioned, but that's one of the things that we would say is relatively benign. And there's also discussion about rooftop plant with screening, and what I'd say to you about that is your planners support that because in almost every apartment type design, if you do have equipment going onto a roof, it's usually preferable to screen it with a fairly consistent screen that is less obtrusive than having the actual equipment uh, on show. And again, the council officer's recommendation to you says to come back to them with the detail that minimises the screening to the extent necessary to do the job, and we accept that. So it's again that balance. There are quite a few elements that in the report before you, the officers have specifically said these are changes, they are things like change of cupboard locations in basements that would never usually go back out to the public for verification or review because they are benign. That's part of that group of 13 changes that have been documented. They are changes from the plans, but they're part of the assessment that says these are things that would always be seen as just working changes to where 
hidden right. things go. I'm going to stop so you there, and thank that's you very fine. much. What I'm saying uh, to you is, I'll just, if I just finish yes, what can. I'm saying. Yep. We understand this is confusing. What I'd say to you is this is not out of the ordinary, even though it can be either confronting or disappointing that change has happened from what the public have seen, but it's not improper and it's not unusual, and this is the best way with the officer's recommendation for some changes to bring the project to completion in a way that balances all those interests. So thank you. Thank you, thank you Chris. All right, we have, uh, Chris, I think you're going to stay there because I think uh, people seem to want to ask you a question. Thank uh, you. Um, can, can, we just Riley. Back, can we go to the image, uh, the photo that shows the arrows and the two? Um, just with respect to this, um, Mr McKenzie, I'm just yeah. wondering if you can actually say, oh, sorry, it might be easy, but I just yeah, want but I, my understanding is that these bollards, or there are structures in here, I believe, if I'm reading that correctly, they are additional and they weren't approved to do with the roof that you're seeking, the rooftops, to go over the balconies. Is that, is that, can you just clarify that? My instructions, and I've read the, the plans, they are shown as endorsed on the 13 October 2017 plans. Yeah. It's been approved. The question is, Council, planners in the discussions with us have said to us they may not have turned their mind to exactly what they felt the implication of that when they approved it. But the reason it's there, built now, is because they are shown on the plans that we have to build to. Can we have a clarification? Sorry. Can we have the officers? Yes, I'm happy to have that. Lachlan, would you be able to answer that question? Or? Uh, yes, I believe I can. Um, the roofs to the second floor balconies are shown on a set of endorsed plans. They were a change that was included uh, when plans were submitted for endorsement. Um, it was not identified in council offices that that was a change that was being made. We do not consider that this is a change that is generally in accordance with the decision plans. It's, it's, sorry, it's a change that's not in accordance with the plan? I don't believe it's generally in accordance with the decision right. plans, which was a requirement of condition one. Yes. Therefore, we do not believe that those roof, roofs to the balconies have been approved, and this application has specifically sought approval for those roofs. Thank you, thank you. Mm -hmm. right, thank you. Um, one more. Yep, and uh, Councillor Martin. Thank you. Um, I just um, would like to know, um, so yourself, what was the, um, sorry, your name and, and where, where you... Sorry, yeah, my name is Chris McKenzie. Chris, I'm yeah. a planning consultant. My business is Melbourne Planning Solutions, but also uh, Traders Planning Appeals. Thank you. Um, could you please outline the, so the, the name of the architect and the name of the developer as well, please, for me? Ed Kairouz is the lead architect and his name is on the plans. Yep. And the developer? Uh, I'm not sure of the, the company name of the developer. The, 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 the client I'm involved with. Um, you have a problem? Pro Pro property services. Property services? Right. So, P-R-A-Q. P-R-A-Q. Property services. Yeah. Okay. Uh, can I ask the the architect and the, and the developer how many uh, developments they've had in the city of Moreland um, over the over the last couple of years? Just interested in that fact. Yeah, I, I don't know the detail of that answer. Yeah. Good. Any projects have been undertaken? Um, yeah, so, so in the ten to twenty, in terms of taking them through planning and some go through construction. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. We'll try, I, I, I understand the line of questioning, but we'll try and stick to this I've application. I've been told the developer this is the first time development for this uh, developer. Thank okay. You. And okay. Thank you, Councillor Bolton. Um, yeah, just a question for you. Sorry, I understand. Uh, now I'm just trying to work this out that there were some changes made to the plans during the VCAP process which um, were not highlighted as changes, um, which now appear on the endorsed plans. Yeah, I think that's going to be I think that might have been the staircase. Inaccurate. I think that's a slightly um, inaccurate chronology. It's okay. not made during the VCAP process, I think. Well, could you just explain, um, you know, yeah, at what, what point things might have changed Without being highlighted to objectors, um, and what and what those changes were, and what the rationale was for not 
highlighting the fact that there were yeah. changes? Because I understand be, that, that's be a the version, common practice. Is that'll that be a version of the very long discussion that was referenced by one of the neighbours because it's it is not a simple answer for me to say here are the changes that were made that were not discussed and why. There, there was a set of changes made when plans were approved by council, I'll just, I'll get you the date, in January 2016. That was the first set of approved plans post VCAT. Approved by council, approved by VCAT. Sorry, just... V VCAT approved the mm. planning permit and there were a set of plans at VCAT. Then the next step is the VCAT or the permit that council issues after the VCAT decision will say you must now submit another revised set of plans to council for their final endorsement and it must do the following things. And one of the wording it used is it must be generally in accordance with the VCAT plans and must also make these changes. So a set of plans gets generated and your planning officers assess those plans and they ask the question, are these generally in accordance with VCAT plans? Do they do what we, what the conditions ask them to do? And if they are satisfied, they stamp them. And that process happens for every planning permit, for two dwellings or for a ten-storey building or for something like this that sits in between that. It's the, it's the absolutely normal process. Your department will review the next set of plans and say, are we satisfied that they're sufficiently similar to the VCAT plans? And do they do the things that they were told to do? My, and there can be variations between the two that are <coughs> acceptable. My question is that I understand usually as part of that process, um, the developer will highlight the changes, um, you know, especially significant yes, yes. changes, will yes. draw attention to the fact that these are the changes because obviously yes. all these plans are very complicated, it's easy to miss small changes, etc., mm -hmm. or even some big changes because, it, you know, so um, what I'm wondering is why there were some quite major changes where there was no highlighting of those changes um, when those plans were presented to the council in January or whenever you said it was presented. And I, I can't, or do you I, agree that that... Look, I, I can't give you an answer to that in terms of why something did or didn't happen. What I do know is that quite often when plans are submitted to the council, there's a process of submitting plans there's also a process of sitting down with the allocated planner and walking through the plans, and it's not always captured in the documentation, everything that's also explained. In the officer report, though, for example, you referenced the spiral stairs mm. at the back. The, um, the letter that accompanied those plans specifically mentions... I've got that one here because I had been told it may have been a question. The letter of the 24th of September 2015, so this is post VCAT but before any plans have been approved, as a reference on the back page, please note a roof access spiral stair has been located on the balcony of 2.3 for maintenance. So to say that it wasn't highlighted is just not true and that's one of those elements at the start I said it's very hard for me to go back and correct every error in what you've been told tonight. I'll try and give you the overall flavour. But it's, it's not always as you seem. That is one example of something that was definitely flagged. To come back now and say it wasn't is actually unfair to the applicant. OK. All right. I think, now, are there any further questions? Uh, Councillors, do I have a motion before... Do I, do, I just ask Yes, I'm sorry, Councillor. Yes. Uh, Council officers? Yes, you may, um, of course. I'm just wondering if um, you might be able to alert councillors to whether or not there were some changes made to the plans without them being highlighted and what those changes were. I mean, the more significant ones, not the... Yes. Thank you. Uh, as far as I'm aware, the most significant change that was made to the plans without making council officers aware is the addition of the roofs to the second floor. The changes to the stairwell was flagged and the council has considered that and, and granted approval for that stairwell. Oh, okay, thank you. Thanks, Lachlan. I'm oh, just wondering um, if I'm this would be appropriate, the ones that I wanted to refer to? Uh, I'm sorry, we've had right, an objection time. We're going to, we're going to, I'm sorry. I've now, got a recommendation. Uh, yeah, yeah, sorry. 
Well, so being in committee, so you've you've got a motion, Councillor. Okay. Right. Okay. You may move the motion. I would like to move an alternative uh, resolution to that which is recommended by the officers. And so the, I'll just read it out. It's not terribly long. Uh, council resolve that a refusal <coughs> to grant an amended planning permit um, number MPS slash 203 slash 309 slash A be issued for the modification to the approved apartment development at 3 to 5 Centennial Avenue, Brunswick West, on the following grounds. First, one, the proposed amendments will have an unreasonable visual bulk impact on the amenity of neighbouring properties and character of the area as a result of the following modifications. A, the additional roof forms over the second floor south facing balconies. B, the additional section of second floor wall at the southern end of the eastern elevation. C, the height and extent of screening to the rooftop service area. And the final point, number two, the deletion of planters from the south facing first floor balconies will have a ne negative impact on the privacy of neighbouring properties and on the appearance of the development. Okay, so that's a motion for refusal. And do we have a seconder for that motion? Se seconded by Councillor Carly Hannon. Um, now that we have a mover and a seconder, you can speak to it, Councillor. I'll only speak uh, briefly, um, but certainly I must admit I am concerned that residents, um, including residents who might have been opposed to the original development, but then once it had been approved by VCAT, had decided that they should learn to live with it, um, were then became alarmed that the development appeared quite different to the plans that were approved at VCAT. So I am um, very concerned about that. Um, I think their range of uh, points which have been raised tonight, um, which are of great relevance, particularly um, the uh, this extra roofing. Um, but you know, uh, yeah, I, I, I think the main, the critical issues are the the visual bulk um, of of this um, development with the changes which I believe were not approved and, and certainly the community not alerted to. Um, and I really worry about the um, confidence of residents in the planning scheme um, <coughs> if, you know, residents start to, you know, go through the whole process with council and with VCAT, but then suddenly they see something going up that's quite different. And I think... Um, for council to approve um, approve this permit, I think sends a very bad uh, message uh, to developers that it is possible to build something that's different from what people are expecting. Uh, and I, I believe this will um, send a green light to developers to try this in other developments. Um, so I actually think we really do need to take a strong stand and reject this development. I think there are a number of amenity impacts and I know that I gather the residents have learnt, you know, learnt to accept some of the um, some aspects that they were opposed to in the beginning but then to have additional um, amenity impacts I think is ma uh, massively problematic for residents. Thank you Councillor Bolton. Councillor Carly Hayne is the seconder. Yep. Um, so I rise to support Councillor Bolton's motion. Um, the main reason being around the unreasonable visual bulk. I do believe that whilst the height might appear quite reasonable, uh, it is quite a sensitive interface in this uh, very residential uh, neighbourhood. And what I can imagine here is that if these roofs did not exist and you had open balconies uh, with good amount of uh, tree coverage and lighting, it would be a much nicer development, not just for the residents um, in these neighbourhoods that are here with us tonight, but the residents that are actually going to live in these developments as well. The other thing is that that uh, shading on top of the roof, uh, I'm not exactly sure why it's the height that it is, but if you look at these photos here, you can see that it actually adds quite a lot to that sky. And um, if people are actually on top of those, then the impact on these residents is going to be significant as well. Thank you, Cal uh, Councillor Carly Hannon. Uh, do we have a speaker against the motion? Any other speakers for the motion? 
Councillor Riley. Look, um, I just want to rise to speak on this because it, it is, it's obviously a significant issue that it actually has come to our uh, our attention here at the at the the new um, council council meeting with planning related matters. <clears throat> so, in that respect, it, it highlights the complexities of this this matter and also the fact that officers have tried to address and and remedy some of those issues in the um, the recommendation that was tabled. Um, however, I, I'm kind of falling um, to the the speakers that have already presented in terms of their the loss of confidence in our system and, and the policing, we, which we as a council are trying to do in terms of making sure enforcement occurs and that people comply with what they do. That's a very expensive undertaking. Um, we don't manage to do it across all of the city, but we are trying to improve our um, monitoring and follow up of, of, um, of significant um, applications and this is probably one of those that we well, I hope we would have picked it up in the in the process, but we are trying to in, in, to do that, and I just think that we need to be really clear um, when we when we're addressing developers and and so on that they actually treat the processes uh, well, and it would be really important to have these things highlighted for officers because of the complexities that have been noted. I just um, uh, support the the motion, the alternative. Okay. Any other speakers? Being no further speakers, I'm going to put it to the vote. So we're voting for uh, Councillor Bolton's notice, notice of refusal, and which is moved by her and seconded by Councillor Carly Hatton. I'm going to put it to the vote. All those in favour of the refusal? Against? I declare that carried. Noted as and unanimous. You like it, notice unanimous. And I'm going to return to Lachlan now for the way forward. Confirming that the council has decided to issue a refusal to grant an amended planning permit for modifications to an approved three-storey apartment building subject to the grounds contained within the alternative motion. Following the issue of the refusal to grant a planning permit, or an amended planning permit, both the applicant and objector parties will receive a copy of the refusal. The applicant will have 60 days to appeal the council's decision to the story, civil and administrative tribunal. Thank you very much indeed, Lachlan, and thanks for the way in which you presented tonight. That concludes the business we have tonight, councillors, members of the gallery and our viewers live streaming at home. Thank you for your attendance and interest, and I declare the meeting closed at 8.25pm. Thank you, Linesman. Thank, Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Chair. G'day, guys. My name's Chris. Hi. Hi. I'm here from Moreland City Council just to show you a bit about this tractor and how it works and what we do and how we uh, get around and cut all the grass on the ovals. How's that? Is that better? Hey, come here. One, two, You want to play tag with the tractor? Your teachers will find it. Thank you very much. Bye, goodbye. Bye. 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 He's trying to get a bump. There he goes through the gate. In 2009, Council...